This episode of Monty's Minute is brought to you by Audible for a free 30-day trial and to receive a free audiobook, just head on over to audible.com slash gamebreaker. Gamebreaker TV. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Monty's Minute, episode 28 for April 28, 2013. I'm Gary Gannon. You're watching Game Breaker TV. Joining me, as always, on Monty's Minute is the one, the only, Mr. Monty Sharma. How are you, sir? I'm fabulous, Gary. How you doing? Excellent, excellent, excellent. Psyched to get back into some more viewer questions on the Monty's Minute. And don't forget, peeps, if you guys have questions for Monty, send them into Monty at GameBreaker.tv. That's the email address that you can send your questions to if you got questions for Monty. Let's start it off this week from one from Chad. He says, uh, hey, Monty and Gary, love the show. Keep up the amazing work. On to my question. I have, very, I have a very limited knowledge on uh, programming. Okay, I have none. <laughs> he went from very <laughs> limited to <laughs> zilch honest. zero. At least he's honest, yes. Yeah. He's none, okay. I have a lot of ideas for games. I want to get into programming my own games. Which programs would you recommend for a single person to make their own games at their own speed? People I've spoken to tell me C++ uh, is the best to learn to, how to use in the most common. Should I start there or elsewhere? I prefer your opinion uh, than the people I've talked to. Thanks, Chad. I think a single single person. I think, I think I'm going to go a different route here, but I want to hear your answer first. Yeah. No, uh, I think we agree. The, Does it start um, with a U and it ends with a Y? <laughs> oh, no, no. I wouldn't even start there. Oh, really? Okay, then. No yeah. <laughs> no, so um, so I, I'd point you a couple of routes. The first off, um, programming is a very different way of sort of thinking about problems in, in solving them. And so learning how to program, just learning the elements of programming is important. And you can actually learn a lot of that stuff with something like um, Game Salad or Game Maker, which lets you put the logic in, but you don't have to observe um, all the syntax and all the complexity of a real programming language. And so you can start putting some of your ideas um, into existence without really knowing how to program. Um, I recommend that as a starting point because programming, it's a long Call before you can actually do something useful. Like you're going to spend several weeks of effort before you can do anything that you look at and go, oh, that's something I made and impressed with. With one of these programs, you can actually do that fairly quickly. And then you've got a better sense of what you're trying to do. So to move on from there, so let's say you know, you've mastered those, you're happy, you want to go into uh, real coding. There's sort of three paths you can take. So one, is, as Gary pointed out, is Unity. Um, they've got uh, a great environment, lots of tools to work with, uh, great educational material out there. So you can start with Unity as an engine to start working with that um, and take some of the ideas that you sort of prototyped in Game Salad and, and turn them into something in Unity. Um, the next step would be, I'm actually going to say Objective C. So that's Apple's version of C. And um, the nice thing with it is there's some really good programs out there about it. And, um, you know, Stanford offers one on iTunes. That's so really good. Um, there, there's several other things like that. And again, if you've got, you need to have a Mac um, and, uh, you know, an iOS device. But very quickly, you learn model view controller systems. You learn how to handle UI and things like that. And yep, it's not you know a 3D graphical game, but it'll get you coding with a real language. And they do a few things that are a little nicer than C++. So it's better for um, a starting coder. And I'm sure the purists are going to be having a fit over that. Um, and then, you know, finally getting into something like C++, sure. Uh, at the end of the day, every coder wants to go to the lowest level language they are capable of going into. So if you're, um, you know, if you're working in an engine, 
you're going to pay some prices. There's a little bit of efficiency. There's some things you can't do. And so you're going to want to use the hooks to go lower than that. You want to write some native code. Um, I come from back in the day when people would actually go down to assembly and, and just scoff at somebody using C. I mean, come on, amateur. <laughs> That's interesting because when I read the, when I first read the, uh, the question there, I just sort of assumed that somebody with ideas for games want to get things as quickly down of like prototyping. So game salad, is that is that the quickest sort of way to get something up and running? Yeah, so both game salad and game maker, they give you things like here's some placeholder art. Um, here's some basic logic models. And you can start with these and then you can start manipulating them and you can explore game ideas very quickly, and you can actually kick out an iOS version from, I think, both of them now. Um, and so they're, they're really kind of cool for somebody who doesn't know a lot of stuff right now for them to start working uh, on, on some of your ideas because, um, you know, whatever ideas you have, they probably come down to a few common game mechanics that these, these products would have built right into them. So you start with that, and then you... You know, um, every two years I try and teach myself a new programming language, and I, I always fail because I'm not, I'm not a coder at heart. <laughs> you know, I, I get into it, I can read code, you know, I, I understand what's going on, but all the stuff it takes to really learn, you know, one of these languages from start to finish and getting the syntax right and all that stuff, even though development environments today are so much nicer. Than, uh, than when I started out. I started out doing Fortran with punch cards. And um, there was this one time when we finally moved to terminals. I had a bug in my program. It was throwing a syntax error, meaning you type something that doesn't make any sense, not logically, but just um, textually. And I couldn't find it. And I looked, and I looked, and I looked. And then I, I threw my hands up in the air because the assignment was due, and I rewrote it again from scratch, saying, I don't know what the hell I did wrong, but I'm going to start from scratch. I'm going to do it again. And this time it worked. And it was the same logic. And I went to my professor and I said, you know, Dr. Lau, I don't get this. What did I do wrong? And he said, oh, you know what? We're still using the same version of Fortran that ran with the punch cards. And you must have put a space in one of the columns that couldn't handle a space. You can't see it on the terminal. It doesn't print out. It's just, ah, oh, You can't even find it. You just had the error in yeah. there. It's just you guys, you kids got it easy today with your programming environments. Yeah. Oh, it, you know, your loops are color-coded. It auto-fills in variables. No, where the hell did I accidentally put in the wrong variable name? <laughs> All sorts of stuff like that. And Objective-C does a lot of the um, uh, memory handling, so it'll release memory, and you've got less shots of having memory leaks and things like that. So there's there's some good stuff out there, but you know, programming can be daunting. That's that's really what I'm I'm saying. And unless you're really driven or good at it or have a sense of it, don't start there. Start with something that's going to get you excited about making the games you're interested in, and then that will pull you through the rest. All right, next up, this one in from Tori. She says, uh, my little brother told me that he wants to be a game designer or a developer when he grows up. He's 10, by the way. He's 10. <laughs> uh, Tori says, what do you recommend would be a good place for him to start preparing himself for something like that down the line at a young age? It's a good question for yeah. a 10-year-old. It is. Uh, well, I, I trust Tori's a little older than that. But um, so, <laughs> you know, it, Kids wanting to be game designers, the number of people I run into in the course of a week who said, yeah, my, you know, my son uh, predominantly wants to be a game designer. My son wants to be a game designer. And it's really part of that is an offshoot of, you know, when you were kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know, policeman, fireman, doctor, because you know what those people did for a living. You know, you, you don't know uh -huh. what a film editor does. You don't know what a business development executive does. Yeah. Um, so you pick these things, and so a lot of kids are picking and saying, okay, I want to be a, a game developer, and that's awesome. That's great. So when you're 10, you know, you actually just want to start playing games with them and asking them questions. You know, why do you think they did this? Why do you think they did that? What would make this a better game? And just get, you know, somebody thinking about the games, and, and, and there's a real difference between playing a game and thinking about it intellectually. And so as he starts to do that, get some ideas. Gets a little older, um, 
playing with level editors or um, you know design tools, modding tools or games. something. Yeah, yeah. Start start with level editors. Just get your head around laying stuff out. Get into things like you know Team Fortress, you know modding kits and all that stuff, and just start. Hey, I want to create a um, you know my son did this thing which was like a jailhouse. So I want to do this thing where it's a prison and the doors all open. And that's that's going to be my team fortress um, uh, level. It, they learn a lot, so that, you know they start figuring these things out, and then into things like game salad, like we talked about. And by the, the time he hits high school, um, you know we'll be able to start programming in a real language. Yeah, and there's probably a few other levels in there as well, but they'll be they'll be they'll be obsolete by the time he gets old enough. But um, I mean, like, like, well, today the head start started for Neverwinter. So if you're looking for MMO design, their foundry is, is extremely robust from what we've seen so far already to actually create mm -hmm. MMO levels. And then also there's, um, this for some other people out there who might be able to do this stuff, but the Arma three alpha right now, which is great. That's got some incredible tools as well that you can play with. So there's a lot of tools out there. So I'm sure, yeah. you know, when, when he's a little bit older, there will be some other tools, uh, just, just the same. Uh, next up Just is take whatever game he likes. Yeah, but I think it's great uh, advice to start talking to him now and start trying to dissect it and think about it. Uh, T-Man is a bit of a long, he's got two questions. It's, Hello, Gary and Monty. I have two questions. The first might be fast, so here it goes. 64-bit clients and why don't developers build them? Uh, we are living in a computer world where the power from a 64-bit uh, 64-bit isn't used. We have all these awesome hardware, all this awesome hardware, and we basically play Pong on them. It must be so much easier. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so why don't more uh, game companies, why aren't they developing 64-bit yet? I think you're going to start seeing that in the next year to two years uh, really come out. Um, so what I did before this was I went and checked the Steam hardware survey. And right now, 10% of the machines that run Steam are running 32-bit um, <laughs> OSs. Oh, 64-bit uh, I mean. No, no, they're they're running 32 bits. So ni ninety percent are running are 64. Bit. Oh wow! Yeah, okay. but if you go back a year, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's a much more substantial amount. We're running 32 bit. So if you look at a game, takes you know a year to two years at least to make, if not four or five. When you start out and you have sort of the tool set that you're going to use, you look at you look at the same hardware survey and you say, okay. What's the min spec of machine we're going to accept? And so, you know, for a long time, I mean, in 2008 or 9, I was still having people saying, can you support this on dial up? Um, you know, <laughs> it's bizarre because I. Kids are like, what is that? I don't even know what that is, Monty. <laughs> dial up. <laughs> I've had broadband since 97. I, I, I couldn't imagine, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, and, and so when you start, you're looking at it and you're saying, okay, we're going to go 32-bit or 64-bit, right? So now that it's down to about 10%, if I'm a developer and I'm looking at it, it's like, great, do we have all the tools we want that will do it in 64-bit? And uh, why not do that? You know, we, we, it, it is a, a better way to work. All right, T-Man, second question here. Let's see if you can answer this one. It's a tough one. I don't really know. Uh, my second question is related to Game Breaker, Burger Game Breaker, Massively, or any of the other fan and news sites out there. So how much of an impact do they have on game development, actually? Um, he says he knows, like, you know, with interviews and devs watching this stuff, uh, are they actually listening to the community, looking at outside of their own forums and things like that? Um, <clears throat> yes, <laughs> is, is, is the simple answer. So. Uh, and again, well, let me paraphrase that with if it's a decent sized studio. So if you've got a good staff um, size, they're going to be looking all over the place. So the marketing people are going to be reading everything that shows up on, you know, the major news sites. Um, the community people, even while you're in dev, are looking at your forums, but they're also trolling major sites, um, you know, uh, I, I know several people, you, you, essentially you build a search that's searching your stuff everywhere and you're constantly looking at it. Now, you know, the question is how much of an impact does that have? So for the game designers, um, you know, there's some impact of, hey, this doesn't play very well, or we saw that and that looks stupid, you know, all that sort of thing. They look at, they hear, and, and people read their own press, right? 
um, they will either decide that no, we're sticking with the path we're on because we believe in that vision, and you know the player just hasn't figured it out yet, um, or they'll say, oh uh, yeah, you know this is kind of hard, and we're going to shelve this whole uh, component. And, and this is why you know people uh, we we had the complaint a few episodes ago of. Um, how come what we see in the press demo two years before the game comes out is not the same as the game? Well, this has happened based on some of this um, informal feedback. So all of those things do impact uh, the game developer, and they're thinking about it and in, in reacting to it. And sometimes they are saying, you know, to hell with you. Uh, I'm going this way. I'm trying to build this. Um, and you just have to do it the right way. I mean, that... Uh, for a guy from Microsoft ended up having to resign over saying it the wrong way. Yeah, they have to look at everything, I think, with, with, a, with a grain of salt to some extent to realize that we don't have the full picture like they do. So I'm sure they're taking it all into consideration. But again, like nobody has the full picture except on the inside. All right, last up today, let's uh, one from Jason P. Jason's got a sort of a two-parter that I'm going to combine here. He's uh, he's 31 years old, and uh, after some trial and error, he's, he's, he's uh, kind of decided to go into the gaming industry. So he says, no experience. Um, other than playing games, he wants to know one, a, is it too late for him to get into the gaming industry? I have an idea that you're going to say no, cause no is never a good answer. And B, um, he says for someone who wants to try their skill as a concept artist, uh, would I need to make a 2d portfolio to include my, with my application and resume? So a little more of a specific one there. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so obviously no, you're not too old to, um, to start and, um, uh, Geez, I didn't get into it till I was uh, 40. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's not restrictive that way. The one thing I would say is, as a concept artist, um, that that's a fairly high level of employment. So um, only some of the best artists in the studio will work on concept designs. There's only going to be a couple of them, um, and you know, it's 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 a relatively exalted role. So if you're going to get into that, you need to have really substantial stuff that that shows what you can do. Um, and the other part of that is doing that stuff in the style of the company you want to work for. So, you know, um, uh, we do this thing when we're talking to students in the, in the Boston area, and we say, look, you know, if you look around town, there's you know, there's a bunch of companies, but there's probably four or five big ones. If you want to mm-hmm. work for one of these four or five big ones in art, you look at their art style and then you mimic it. And you do things in each one of these art styles to show that I have the kind of range to do this, this, and this. And that way, when, you know, somebody's looking at it, they go, oh, okay. You know, you're not just, um, like I saw one portfolio and it was all just like open looking. It's like the same guy in five or six different poses. Um, and it's like, okay, if I was doing elfin guys, sure, maybe I'd look at you. But I, I have no idea what else you can do. Yeah, this is so, this is a, an insanely competitive place to be. I mean, you're talking top, top, top tier. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm reading into a little bit, unless Jason is like insanely gifted. Um, mm-hmm. He's saying he has no experience in this industry. So it's kind of hard to say. It's gonna be, next to impossible to get a concept right. artist level position. So you got to look, I think you got to look elsewhere and kind of like, you know, start out as like an apprentice under somebody. Yeah. It, you, you might be able to get an art position if what you've been doing for the last five, six years is art, but in a different industry, or maybe you're an MFA grad and, and you've just been doing your own art. That's great. Um, you know, all of those things will get you there, but you're going to have to put together, you know, a smashing portfolio and, and probably shoot a little bit lower. Yeah. And it's, t- it's, t- this is a, this is such a tough subjective area, right? I remember, um, I remember going and watching some, uh, some speakers over at, um, this, what's the Institute over here in LA? Nomon? Is it Nomon? I think it's the 3d art. It's mm-hmm. like all 3d Maya, like all those kinds of things. They do right. these like things. Sometimes they have great speakers come out and they, you know, after they have the speakers, they have some tables set up and they let people bring their stuff and people look at it and kind of evaluate it and give them like some feedback. And it's just literally just young kids showing up with like, you know, a portfolio of stuff. And, and this stuff is amazing. And even mm-hmm. those guys at that point are like, yeah, this is okay. Like, you know, right. you can really, you could really work on this. It's like, they're looking at stuff on such a different level 
So, mm-hmm. and not, not, so I'm not trying to discourage Jason here oh, with no. this, but I think it's really important to also be able to have a really good perspective on and, and, and be true to yourself to realize, like, do you have the chops to be at that level? Because if you're just drawing stuff on your own and your friends and family are telling you, Hey, this is awesome. That's one thing. Maybe go to some of these things where they are looking at some of this art and see what some of these other people are doing and be like, Hey, like, can I really do this? Because these, these kids are amazing. Like doing you know, almost Kojima style, like artwork, which yeah. is just knocking it out of the park. And if you look at some of the sites and you see what they put up as concept art, you know, and can you do it really at that level? Um, and even then, even if you can do it at that level, you know, getting that concept artist role, um, there's more to it also than just the art because you're trying to understand the game and the essence of the Mm -hmm. game and what they're trying to create when you're doing these pieces. Um, You're trying to do things that lead the programmers and the technical artists on which path they want to go. I I remember seeing this one thing in, you know, fitting, uh, it's FanFest right now and we are not uh, with everybody else drinking. Um, We both should have been there. (laughs) Next year, man, next year. Uh, But, um, you know, I, I remember one of the concept artists for CCP saying one time is, you know, look, well, we drew this, and uh, the response back from engineering and the technical artist was, you're nuts. There's no way we can make the light fall that way. And look, you put in 18 different light sources into this one thing. Do you know how hard that's going to be for us to code in the machine overhead? So, you know, and, and so they're trying to revise it of how do we get the right feeling that fits within some of these technical constraints. So, you know, it is more than just uh, good looks. That it is. Monty Sharma, follow him on the Twitter at Monster, M-O-N-T-S-T-E-R 27. And like I said earlier, if you guys have a question for Monty, make sure to send it over to Monty at GameBreaker.tv. Send us the question. Monty will answer it. Answer it. Answer it. You got those T's, monster, mont, enter. Yes. Answer, enter. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Gary Gannon and follow Game Breaker TV at Game Breaker TV. And we will see you next week for more Monty's Minute. Have a great week. See you, Monte. You too, Gary. Hang in there. You got a long night ahead of you.